I often forget. So, all right. Well, welcome everybody to uh, tonight's uh, webinar with Jan Fisher Bachman. The webinar is entitled, There Is No Should in Social Media. And uh, it is uh, uh, terrific to have each and every one of you with us this evening. Uh, tonight, uh, as we know, and as uh, you've already been sharing uh, with congregations unable to meet in person, there may be the feeling of pressure about technology and skills, uh, you know, the things that we feel we may need to have and also to grow in. And this webinar is to ask you to consider uh, for yourself why, uh, focusing on skills and assets you already have and the needs of your group. And so tonight, uh, Jan and, uh, will lead us in, uh, in uh, some concepts and ideas, and, but open up for conversation as we look at what are some of the most popular social media tools and uh, then also practical tips on setting up and scheduling and using them. Our presenter tonight is Jan Fisher Bachman. She is the web producer for the Church of the Brethren. Uh, she has broadcast on Facebook Live for the denomination, as well as her home congregation, uh, which is the Oakton Church of the Brother. And uh, she has managed to take the inadvertent selfies and shots featuring her fingers while live. So, and then later uh, in the session, I will uh, post in the chat box the, uh, the link for the CEU credit, but it is a great privilege to have Jan here. I get to work with her and she is a terrific colleague and a wonderful human being and very much passionate about her faith and also the church. But before we get started, will you join me in prayer? Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our God, in your mercy and kindness, no thought of ours is left unnoticed, no desire or concern ignored. You have proved that blessings abound when we fall on our knees in prayer, and so we turn to you. Oh God, we realize that this is a time that is surrounded by, for cries for justice, with seeing injustice, cries for healing, due to the pandemic, and we hear your voice telling us to do justice, to love goodness, and to walk humbly with your God. Oh God, we just pray that you fill us with your mercy and with your compassion, so that we in turn may be merciful to others, that you strip away pride and suspicion and racism, so that we may seek peace and justice in our communities strengthen our hearts so that they beat only to the rhythm of your will. O God, flood our path with your light as we walk humbly toward a future filled with encounter and unity and compassion and love. Be with us, O Lord, in our efforts, for only by the prompting of your grace may we progress toward virtue. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, Jan, welcome, and uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one little note to you all is that I can get started talking pretty fast when I get excited about things. So if I'm getting hard to understand, please just uh, wave your hand or write a note in chat and say, hey, slow down. Um, I have to say, one of my nicknames in college was the auctioneer, so that is my native way of speaking, so I, I'm trying hard to not be that way today. I wanted to start, oddly enough, with the biblical basis for social media, which is probably something you haven't really thought about. I think the closest we have to social media in the Bible is Paul's letters. So I'd like us to just think quickly, if you can review your, back to your letters, the first chapters, why did Paul write his letters? And just feel free to unmute, or if you'd rather type, do whatever you prefer. What are some of the reasons Paul wrote letters? Uh, I think it was a response to an inquiry from a church or a congregation. So answering questions, good one, yep. 
being in communication with with folks who are distant. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it was a part of forming community as well. Uh, writing to a group and uh, trying to provide a, uh, a voice for values and faith and amidst conflict and, or whatever else the, the uh, congregation may be experiencing at the time. Right. Yeah. Speaking of conflict in first Corinthians, it's, um, he appeals to them to stop fighting. So that was a specific one for that letter. Other, um, other things you might remember from some of the letters. Well, I was thinking, um, he also, uh, lifts up individuals within the congregation. Um, naming uh, 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 naming a gift or naming the um, that this person is a uh, a worthwhile leader and you know you need to lift listen to what they're doing or even just proclaiming good things that the congregation is doing and just reaffirming for them that they're doing good work. Great. So. I think too the reminding them, reminding folks of their connection beyond uh, their community and even beyond their community with him, but with mm -hmm. the other communities as well. Great point. Yeah, that telling them about what's happening in different places. Mm -hmm. I have to do things the old-fashioned way here on the campus, and so it's a lot of notes and cards and phone calls. Um, it's just reminding people that you're still here for them and that they are, you know, to help them stay interconnected. Uh, just to remind them to um, not just worry about themselves, but be concerned for the whole body, you know, and, and whether we can meet personally or not, there's still a lot that we have to do and to accomplish while we are apart. So that's really what we're struggling with here, just being apart. So we need to keep that kind of keep it congealed as much as we can. So, and I feel like Paul, you can't write enough right now to keep people, because our folks don't have computers. Our folks don't have laptops and Zoom and, you know, smartphones and Skype and all that. It, we don't have it. <laughs> uh, Linda's and, and Mark's comments reminded me that Paul encouraged uh, a number of churches to take up the offering for Jer for the Church of Jerusalem, and so they were also doing social ministry, uh, you know, fee uh, taking care of the poor, the widows, and uh, you know, other people who were disenfranchised. And so there was a lot of social justice through those uh, those written documents and, and communications. Interesting. That's yeah. Anything else you can remember from some of the letters? Got Romans, Corinthians. Teaching, I think, is a big deal, too. Even um, right now, a lot of what I'm doing is writing, um, writing for the church and its members and friends, writing for the whole community. I'm writing for a group of team members who want to have an inspiration of some kind every day. And then I'm writing for the whole group of team members as they pray for one another. So a lot of, um, uh, I'm doing a lot of writing, just teaching. Um, I have to be careful because every group, you know, you can get real theological with some groups and you got to be real broad with others. So, uh, and, and Paul did a lot of that, I think, trying to remember our roots and, you know, what, where our, well, our faith is founded on, but also how we can take that and for our everyday lives and with everybody's situation and circumstances. And so again, not think so always just about ourselves and the situations we're in. But you know, we're all in this together. We all need to, to work together, so. I think kind of bouncing off of what Linda just said, reminding us of the roots, but even he's uh, telling his own faith journey so I think he's modeling for the communities how to share their own faith uh, in a appropriate way. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, and taking that even further, I think being authentic, because Paul doesn't pretend that things are perfect. Mm. Right. He is very real about his life. And also about costs that are involved. I mean, he's very upfront that hmm. this, is what, this is what I'm having to do. Um, and I've always interpreted that to me, to me to say, don't think that there won't be a cost for you as well. That's just part of the part of the situation. So, which is also kind of a challenge or encouragement, either depending what you, how you take it or what your need is. And I think that can be struggling in what we're going through now because um, I think a lot of times people are looking for, well, what, how's the easiest way I can get by until we get back to normal? Um, and my, my preference is to rephrase that question. Uh, why, why is that the question we go to? Uh, what's the easiest way I can do this? That's interesting. So those are quite a few of the things. I'm sure there's, we could go on all day because those letters are just packed with good things. But um, so what are our, our equivalents to Paul's letters? I mean, Linda, you've already said you write letters. So literally your equivalent in some cases is cards and letters. But what are some other ways we could accomplish some of those things that we're talking about? A telephone for, for, for me is one of the ways that you're, I'm able to communicate with all of my people, regardless of technology mm -hmm. issues. So that takes that uh, potential stumbling block out of the mix. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think certainly, uh, I don't do it every Sunday, but there are occasions where I'll take a minute or two out of my uh, uh, welcome or introduction just to thank people who are doing certain things within the congregation. So reminding the congregation that even though we're not physically meeting, we are still doing the work of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and then also through email correspondence, I send, I try to send uh, two a week. One is specific prayer requests uh, that have been shared uh, up to a certain point. Um, and then the other one, I sometimes it's just like a, you know, a personal reflection um, or a story that someone shared with me that was uplifting and that was just celebrating in the midst of all the chaos and turmoil we're experiencing that we can still take joy and a simple act of generosity or uh, faith action. Um, so trying to just share those uh, stories that I'm hearing in a larger context. I've also been doing, uh, to try to level the playing field, we actually uh, US mail um, bulletin uh, mm -hmm. letter and hymns to every congregant uh, yeah. weekly um, and so there is a weekly letter that goes with that uh, now the, I will admit the last half of that deals with reminding them how to get in stepping through it every time um, but the front half of that deals with uh, either what what's coming up or what maybe leadership is helping with and so trying to keep those letter contacts uh, since that's going weekly basis and that also would include those who are not coming uh, to the service are able to communicate in that way. Well, it sounds like you all have really creative and wonderful ways of being in touch with your congregations. So um, it may be a question mark like, well, why would you ever want to use social media? So we'll look at what some of the things are. I mean, the first thing to consider is really what is your gift? We're the body of Christ, so clearly if your nose walking on your nose, you know, is not going to work for you. And if you're a foot, you probably shouldn't try to eat. So it's knowing yourself and your gifts, but it's also possible to expand those gifts to a new place. So, you know, Pastor Linda, if you have a gift of writing letters, it's possible that you there could be a place you could write letters online to reach some people. So it's 
I think we've, as you've all already expressed, we've been stretched and pulled in this time period to look at new ways. But please, I encourage you not to let somebody else tell you what you should be doing if that's not really your giftedness. <laughs> um, but it's great for all of us to be open to new ways. And I agree with what, um, Pastor Mark, what you said is the question isn't how can we get through this as painlessly as possible and just get back to normal. Isn't that helpful? So considering, um, too, what your congregation needs, what your people need, and I'm gonna add here what you need, because one thing that people don't necessarily consider about social media is it could be a place for you to also find some encouragement, replenishness, some thanks, and so forth. So even if your people don't use social media, it might be a place where you could find some encouragement. Um, and that's gonna mean looking for some very specific things, not reading the comments on the Washington Post articles, <laughs> <laughs> which is not gonna encourage anybody. So um, just, I'm, I meant to have a little poll, I didn't get it done. Um, which social media sites do any of you all actually use now? Anybody use Facebook? Raise hand. Facebook. So, um, okay. Twitter. Anybody? Only when I'm at annual conference. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really good for that, and that's part of knowing the purpose for things, right? It's great right. for following conference piece by piece. Anybody on Instagram? Kind of. A little well, bit. Well, I have an account. <laughs> okay, right. Well, that counts, right? <laughs> Uh, let's get a little more obscure. Well, that's on LinkedIn. No. I have it, an account. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Nope. How about uh, Snapchat? I did have one, but we removed it. Okay. I think I deleted mine too, actually. Yeah. Um, and then this one, I'm sure I know the answer to this. TikTok? No. Anybody? No. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick look. I'm going to share some slides with you just to go over quickly some of the social media sites, what they are, and ponder what they're good at, okay? So give me just a second to... Will these slides be made available? They are already posted because I know the web person. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. I am the web person. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, so they're posted where? They are right now at brethren.org webcasts, which is where the webinar info is. And it's okay. it'll move to the archive, though, after today. Okay. Or Thank you. I can probably give you the link once we're back off of my sharing screen. If I go looking now, you're going to see a bunch of junk you don't need. Okay, so here's some brief descriptions. Okay, will do. So Facebook, I'm sure you all know you can have private groups or public pages. Um, private is like quotey fingers, right? Because nothing's private online. Please don't mm -hmm. ever think it is. Um, there's no limit to post length. Um, you, you guys, you know, on your Facebook accounts, you can make announcements and that'll put it to the top of the um, Facebook. So if you have something coming up you want everyone to see first, Go ahead and make it an announcement instead of a post and it'll stay up there, but just remember that um, you might want to remove it when things are over. And Messenger, and there's Messenger video rooms, which I haven't actually used, but can be done. So um, YouTube video, of course. Instagram, it's all images. So if you're a photographer, this is a beautiful place to hang out. Um, not great for links because the links in your posts are not clickable. So that's why people always say things like link in bio, because that's where you get a link. Um, hashtag super important here. That's how you're going to pick up more people and how people find things. Twitter, it's short, um, but people will just now do linked posts. The hashtags, again, are important, and it's really a place for, um, if you're trying to set up yourself as an expert of a certain thing, Twitter might be a good place to put some of your thoughts on that. Also good for breaking news, like when there's a disaster, I actually find myself going to Twitter more because even before the news sites have information, people will be posting like, yes, we just had an earthquake or whatever. So, um, Pinterest oh, yeah. visual collections. I'm sorry, did someone? 
Yeah, Jan, just for a question, could you go back to the previous slide? Yes. And this is just Oops. for the recording. Uh, no, I cannot go back, <laughs> evidently. Uh, you have to stop sharing and go back. Oh, that, oh okay. that's all right. That's all right. It's um, okay. Yeah. Uh, for, for perhaps someone who may be uh, connecting to the recording uh, okay. later on, what is the importance of hashtags in, for Twitter? Hashtags are the way it's uh, the way things are grouped together and it's like a search thing. Okay. So in the example I just shared, if I was looking for um, hurricane news from Miami, Florida, if you put hashtag hurricane Pamela or whatever it would be, you're going to get all the posts about that. So if you're trying to connect with people, your hashtags will help them find you. And that's true on all social media, but for instance, I would say on Facebook, people are more likely to be connecting to you, the person, than they are to be looking for random hashtags on something. Because Facebook is better at the people thing. Twitter is actually pretty good. You know, just on Twitter, you don't have friends. You're not, um, your accounts don't tend to be, I don't even know if they can be closed. Um, so the hashtag is a way to search for things. And that's something you can do if you'd like to find out some information. I mean, it's the internet might be questionable, but you can search a hashtag for something specific. So um, for those of us who are on older uh, ways of doing things, the hashtag would be equivalent to the label on our file folder. Yes, sir. File folder that everybody can dump stuff into. Exactly, whether exactly. Whether it actually is appropriate or means anything or not. And someone probably put their ice cream bar wrapper in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let me go back to where I was. I apologize that I don't know how to share my screen and go backwards, but um, I hadn't tried that before, so. And I still went forwards. Hold on. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Okay. So the, these other ones are a little bit less common. Pinterest is like visual collections, so it's a great place for youth games or something. Um, LinkedIn is more work related. TikTok, short videos, Snapchat, um, things that basically disappear. <laughs> you post things, but then they disappear unless people save them with a screenshot. And Reddit is one I included because I know some college age people who said that they wished that there were more Church of the Brethren things on Reddit. It's an anonymous discussion group and it as you can imagine, being anonymous, it can be kind of a dumpster fire, but also it gives people a chance to discuss things when they have time to go. And so I've had some college kids say, I wish someone would post like some Bible study there and people could, you could answer when you could and you could discuss things and so forth. So I just threw that in in case that sparks any ideas for anyone. Uh, Jan, I have a question about um, Pinterest. I had never thought of it for being used for worship ideas. Um, I use it for when I'm doing remodeling or when I'm, mm -hmm. I, I do some play work, so ideas for that. Great. Um, how well, does it link well as far as being able to dig down deep enough to find out where copyrights belong to? I think that that's a great issue for any place on the internet. And I would say when you get to the page that's linked, you have to go looking for usage. Um, I think that ideas are hard to copyright. So I know that, let's say our church, back in the day when not being together was unusual, <laughs> there was a Christmas that was on Sunday. And so we made bags of things that people could take. And the idea came from someone's Pinterest, but the implementation was 100% our own idea. Right. So if you're trying to use a prayer per se or right. a specific image, you absolutely need to look for the copyright. And I think that's wonderful that you even thought of that right away because 
you know, people sometimes feel like it's on the internet. That means I can right. use it. And of mm -hmm. course that's not the case. Yeah, I've already had a lot of discussion with folks about YouTube on that. Well, they put it on there and I was like, yeah, yeah that's for you to watch. That's not for you to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, most videos you can embed them. That's fine. Um, so that because you're link in a sense, you're linking to the site. Links are fine, but um, in all cases, of course, give people the credit, mm -hmm. even if you're, sharing something someone said it's a great idea to give them the credit for it and and i have found it during doing all this i've, I've done lots of um communicating with folks around the world uh because of their videos and it's been interesting to see their responses um and what they want to share back uh with with folks who have been a part um, i've chosen so far to only do virtual uh wires and so forth uh, just from an optics perspective, uh, I didn't want to post a video of a group of people not being social distance uh, mm -hmm. when we're encouraging that. Um, but that's been a really interesting, uh, uh, something that really has fed me uh, is being able to do that, have those conversations with folks. That's great. That's great. So just looking quickly in the U.S., this is the most common social media platforms. So you can see 73% of people are on YouTube, 69% on Facebook, and it goes down from there. 37% Instagram, and we get down to the bottom there. And this was from 2019. I'm sure it's changed this year, but. Interesting point. People are on Facebook several times a day, and that's just something worth pondering if you're like, wow, people are there a lot of times. Whereas look at Twitter people are not necessarily there all the time. It's more sporadic. And that's another reason why hashtags are important is someone might find your fabulous information via hashtag, even if you posted it a few days ago. Um, I think this is pretty interesting. I, are you guys hidden? Hopefully you can see. Um, this is the age range. Blue is ages 18 to 29. Orange is 30 to 49. Gray is 50 to 64. and yellow is 65 plus. So I think it's interesting to look at who is where and which thing. As you can see over here on Snapchat, lots and lots and lots of young people there, more so than some of the more overall popular sites. Um, is this, would this be youth by age or would this be like we were saying, like I have an Instagram account, but I don't use it. These so, are people who, yeah, this is people who claim that they use it. Okay. I think they surveyed people though. I don't think it was from statistics from the companies. And I imagine the reason for that is because the companies are going to tell you that lots and lots and lots of people are using right. it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause, yeah. Cause I feel like, I mean, if, and I, I'm not, I don't have the stats or that, but I feel like Facebook is actually on the down trend with that 18 to 29 age group right now. Yeah, I mean, you can so see that, that, even, that yeah. stat is pretty surprising to me. Yeah, this is from 20, this, these figures are from 2019. So, but you can even see from this that Facebook is lower than um, YouTube. That's true, yeah. And really by now it would probably be lower than Instagram too. Yeah. So that's absolutely, I agree with you. Facebook is definitely its target population has aged a little bit. <laughs> right. So, um, and here's just some interesting things um, that 75% of women have a Facebook and 63% of men, but it flips on YouTube. 78% of men, 68% of women. I just thought that was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Instagram, 43% of women. And this is the only one that had a demographic, like um, they, these stats were done sort of black, white, and Hispanic. And 51% of Hispanic people use Instagram. So that was the only one of all of these where there was any demographic that was notably quite different. Pinterest, 15% of men and 42% of women. And yeah. um, Pew Research didn't include TikTok, but, and this is a different type of statistics, but you can see 37% are ages 10 to 19. TikTok skews super low. Right. 26%. So most of those users are really young. 
So I'm going to switch away from um, screen sharing and just say, so from that, those little pieces of information, what does that tell us? What are some ideas on which um, platforms would be good for which population? I mean, it may not, like Pastor Linda, it may not feel relevant if you're like, well, my population's all older and they don't have social media, so this isn't relevant. You may have other people in your life that you are, or your, you know, home congregation or something. Mm. Anything that jumped out to you about which platform? We Maybe. use a lot. We use a lot of YouTube here on campus, actually, because we're bringing in a lot of programs for our on-campus television programs right now. Mm -hmm. So they're YouTubing all kinds of uh, because we couldn't do. We do a lot of classrooms here, which is you know gatherings, which we can't do. So they've been bringing in a lot of educational stuff through YouTube. So there's there's quite a bit of YouTube now used on campus. They mm -hmm. have not used it for church services, although I know a lot of churches in this area do put their services up on, on YouTube. Not. Right. Yeah. yeah, we're using uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are the three that we're focusing on. Um, so. mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really the big three, um, in a way, depending what you're doing. Um, I'd like to just go back to the um, slides really quick here. But you raise an interesting point because a lot of our congregations, because of the age and size, will say, we want to we want to bring in more young people or young families. But uh, if their social media strategy, if you call it that, or their presence, will actually say a lot about what their capacity is. And so if they're, if they're not even, if they're not learning or considering, you know, multiple oh, uh, social media platforms, then they may be actually uh, their own obstacle to being able to connect with uh, a younger um, generation and also ethnicity, perhaps even ethnicities that are in the community. Well, and I think it raises a different question in terms of ethics. TikTok and um, Snapchat are uh, ethically, um, there are no parental controls on them. So me, my wife and I have said to our children, no. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there are 13 and 14. So like they're in that prime age of having those accounts. Um, so that raises a different question from a church perspective. If we're trying to reach people through social media, what are the ethical ramifications of what we are I don't want to say promoting, but encouraging behavior in our younger children. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through just quickly some, a couple of best, a few best practices, and then some benefits and some um, dangers. And so we'll come circle around and come back to that in just a yeah. minute. Okay. So yeah, great point. No, just because kids are doing it doesn't mean that's where we need to be, but it is interesting to know that, um, and we have, as the Church of the Brethren, we did like a special frames and things for Snapchat during annual conference. And it was mm -hmm. geographically limited to people who were like in the building. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. um, you, cause you can be very specific on that. So, and that yeah. was just a small thing to say, hey, we see you, we know you're here. Right. You know, it yeah. wasn't a... But even that says a lot. Um, in terms of being able, it, it acknowledges, and so you're also looking at a media, and so if media is an extension of ourselves, then what we're using or not using also communicates what what is an extension of who and what we are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just a few best practices for congregation social media. One is try to set the church accounts up with a generic or shared email address. 
I know a temptation is to use like your personal one and that means that if you should ever leave those accounts will have to go with you and that would be sad. Um, make sure at least three people know how to log in that they have that information. Um, the caveat is if you're doing a watch party on Facebook, every person who's an admin has the power to like stop it, restart it, go back, whatever. And so people need to know not to do those things <laughs> or it'll be quite the watch party. Um, be social on social media, respond, comment. It's not really great. We get the habit sometimes that we're only pronouncing, like here's this program you should come to, here's my thought. You know, take time to comment, like things, ask questions, invite participation, because the idea is that community if you're using social media. And right. you may decide you're not using it for that, but if you are using it, um, consider how, if it's for community, how you would do that. And then the last point, super important, assess whether it's accomplishing what you hoped it would accomplish. So, and that's where if you think, I'm gonna do this thing and let's see what happens, take some time to look at who's looking at it, who's not. Um, we decided for the Church of the Brethren that we would mostly, like Pastor Kevin, use uh, Twitter for conferences. And we don't really do a lot with it otherwise because we just didn't see that it was meeting needs. Um, we're on Instagram, even though it's not a big platform, because we can see that the users are a younger generation and we want them to know that their church is there. So, um, I mean, not everyone's younger, but there are definitely some of our younger members. How do you work at uh, <clears throat> time balance? Uh, for small churches that, that many of us are a part of, uh, who are already working um, supposedly part-time, uh, which has more to deal with the check than it does the hours. Um, how I have problems ethically sharing so much with the congregation um, because of whoever will follow me uh, will have the expectation that Yes, you're supposed to be working 27 hours a week, but hey, I'll go ahead and work 40. The person that comes after me then is stuck with a model that that's, that's the norm. Well, and also in the Bible, it says the worker is worthy of their hire. So, I mean, there's a point of doing the hours that, you know, right. not doing a lot of work for free. And so, so how do you um, justify uh, the time element involved um, in working at this if you're the sole person responsible for all of those things? Well, that's a great question, right? Because the question would be, do you need to be the only person responsible? It is um, a big responsibility for someone to be officially the voice of the congregation. So you might not be sure um that you want to let other people do it but is that lack of trust uh not you but let's say is that some, being sort of wanting to keep control or is it legitimately like oh there's nobody who's going to be able to do this well so it is interesting like would there be somebody else who could try it or do it or would find it to be super exciting to do. And I will say from some of our different offices in the Church of the Brethren, um, there'll be takeovers by people. So I think this week, the youth and young adult um, Instagram is being taken over by a youth board member. Um, we've also had volunteers doing social media for certain, like for the NOAC Facebook. Um, so it's a point. I don't think that you need to feel like, oh, I should be doing this. But if you think, wow, you know, using something like that could enhance our community. Can your deacons, do you have any of them who could do it? Do you have youth who would think it was cool? Um, the beauty of things online is you can always delete them. <laughs> so if someone does get a little crazy, you can always uh, shut it down. So I don't think but it would it's have really to never deleted. Uh, it's always, if, if somebody has seen it, it's not deleted. Right. And that comes back to a comfort level. But um, I think that that is something that I think there is kind of a generational change too in that people who are used to, I, I will just say that I think younger people are less worried about things living 
online, but they can come back. Absolutely. And people mm -hmm. catch screenshots. So, yep. you know, your, your mistakes are going to be captured for sure. But it's an interesting question. Um, and definitely, I'm not pushing for anybody to start anything of social media. It's just to be aware of some of the different things, benefits. Here we go. As some of you have said, you found you have more people now that you're online. So it does give you a big wide uh, scope of people. I know at Oakton, we have former members who, um, we started doing Facebook Live last September and we found for some former members started services that way and really loved being able to come to church. So we were thankful that we had already started that when this all happened. Um, you can learn from people outside your usual circles and with all of the um, issues happening right now, if you are not in a particularly diverse position, you can join groups and do things and get to know people who are you wouldn't run into at the local store. So it can be a place for discussion that can go badly too, but it can be a place for discussion and it can offer support and connection. I had an interesting one this week where a person, um, a black woman said, I am just, I can't stop crying. Everything is terrible. This is awful. I don't know what to do. And people are saying, it's okay. It's going to be okay. And she's like, no, 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 it's really not okay. My um, family is at risk. This is awful. And I knew that she's a Christian person and I just came to mind the story of Elijah when he was in despair and sat by the stream and God sent him a bird with food and water and so forth and he slept and I said this is I just shared the scripture with her and she later messaged me and said that was just what I needed to hear I read that and stopped crying and I'm not saying that as a it's just interesting that that could be something that happened on social media right yeah so and I found, um, I, I was invited to, uh, it's a private group. Um, it, um, they, uh, some of my faith leaders in COVID-19. Um, so it started right around when it all started. And I'm meeting people across the world in that. And some of it's redundant, but um, a lot of it is just uh, faith leaders coming together in a very safe space, being able mm -hmm. to share some of what you were just sharing in terms of, the hurts and pains and whatnot of what they're going through. Um, how are you doing funerals? How are you, you know, these other things that mm -hmm. we might not be able to ask. You know, um, Mark, you were asking about how much do you share, you know, on your personal Facebook page and, you know, what, who would see it. And so there's a little bit of a freedom in that. Um, and it's, it's a closed group. It's monitored. Um, and so it, it, that's been a nice uh, help for me during this time as well. Yeah. So dangers, um, privacy concerns, y'all just have said that, like there is that issue and you might decide as a pastor that you don't wanna share your personal page, but you will do a church page. Um, prayer requests are very iffy on your online services, right? Um, think twice about prayer requests when you're recording a service or sharing it live, unless people are really okay. Someone might not want everyone to know their cancer diagnosis or whatever. Um, child protection, we kind of touched on that. No children under 13 are supposed to be on social media. So, and um, Pastor Kevin, you can probably lead this part <laughs> about child <laughs> protection because your kids are right there in that age group. Be really careful if you show pictures of children or if you mention them, never use last names, never give right. locations, never give the name of their school. There should be nothing that somebody could look at the picture and actually physically right. find the child. Right. Um, and that's when we also see some people making mistakes on. Yeah. Uh, be careful and, if you post your bulletins. Um, it's not always great to put people's first last names and birthdays, even anniversaries, because those are often their passwords. So right. that's um, something you might not want to share online either. Yeah. Just what someone I, said. Yeah, I found it interesting with the whole um, issue with graduation. Um, you know, the schools were shared, they were violating their own code yes. of ethics of, mm -hmm. of what they could share. And they were posting pictures of the graduating seniors with first and last names. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? And um, it was 
very, it, it was very awkward. And I know a lot of parents were very upset um, in our community, even though, you know, you signed the release at the beginning of the year, but you're trusting that, that, that they're using it in the appropriate way. So I, um, I have not really seen a whole lot of public conversation about that. And I think, you know, certainly the, the Black Lives Matter and, and that, that whole thing has probably co-opted, co rightly so, the graduation thing, but that just raised to me so many red flags. I, mm -hmm. I was really uncomfortable with that. Yeah, I agree with you, Kevin. And I know that um, I've often had conversations with folks and, and my question always is, you mean there was nobody sitting in that room that said, hey, that might not be a good idea or, <laughs> Hey, isn't that something we agreed not to do? Right. Um, yeah. But I think sometimes when, and, and I think we can end up the same way on the church. I know when we started our website, the things that the board listed they wanted to have done, I had to go back over them and say, no, you can't do this. No, we can't do this. No, we can't do this. Yeah. And I felt like the bad guy coming mm -hmm. and saying, no, don't yeah. take pictures of the few mm -hmm. of the three children we have um, right. because talk about identifying there's only three there so it's a really <laughs> situation um and and people don't think they're 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 well in intentioned right um but i think the security that we have within the church for the most part um sometimes causes us not to think about mm -hmm. the fact that yeah but that's not who this is geared for now right. this is geared for folks well beyond our church and you need to be aware that it's available to the world and um, that that's yeah. something that I think uh, as as cautious people um, at least for myself I'm, I'm one that tends to be the one that says uh, no we're not allowed to do that um, there's good reason not to do that right now you actually probably could find a way to use pictures that involve children if it's taken from an angle so that they're not easy to identify. So you could get a really cute picture of a child squatting down and looking at a flower, but right. it could be right. any child, right? Yes. So there's right. ways to make sure that things um, look better. Yeah. To protect children. Yeah, and, and we've had that discussion. Um, uh, we don't have a policy, unfortunately. I, you know, we, we have tried to explore that, having an online policy, um, but we host every year a Christmas um, program reading with Santa uh, for underprivileged children uh, with the local chip agency. And so we are not allowed to take any pictures. Um, they, there's a professional photographer that takes all the, the photos um, of, with Santa and like the, the, uh, the spontaneous pictures. Um, and so we are very careful in that. And that's something we've worked very hard to uh, be conscious of because those are children. Some of them are in um, separated families, and so you know there that there is a high, heightened sense of protection. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <coughs> it does generate interesting conversations. Um, and so, and even like you go like old school, you talk about church directory. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we had a police officer in our congregation. He did not want, they did not want their address or phone number in the directory because, you know, it, they had children and, you know, they, they didn't know who would get their hands on it. So uh, the office and obviously people in the congregation had that information. It just wasn't published. Uh, in paper form. Right. The biggest way I've seen that slip online is if people post either a bulletin that they might say in the bulletin, it says, oh, here's the new address of so-and-so right. for a yes. newsletter. You have to watch those things. Yeah. Like you can post your bulletin, but just make sure nothing's going online that shouldn't be online. Right. So. Yeah. And like you said, the birthdays and anniversaries for newsletters, that's a big That is a big issue. deal, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I know. It, yeah. I mean, if it's not online, you're probably pretty safe if it's print, right. but. Well, right. But still. Yeah. yeah. So fake profiles and bots, and this is one in a minute, we'll go over how you can tell those. But sometimes if you have a Facebook or something, there'll be a person who starts to argue and cause a lot of um, issues. And it might not actually be a person. 
So um, we'll come back to that, but be aware of that. If you don't know them, it might not actually be a person. Um, arguments, that can be a downside. People who get along perfectly well at potlucks might find that they really don't like each other online because of what they're posting. Inaccurate info, faked images, sharing from bad sources, all of those go to, if this is a church um, site, be, you know, be, just be super careful what you're sharing. Make sure it's actual legit, good site, good, accurate info. And even your own personal, to be honest. Um, your post being lost, by this I mean you put all the effort, you've crafted this beautiful thought and not one person sees it. And that does happen with algorithms. So um, if you're finding that, you know, you can ask some people to try to share them and comment on them and that will help you out some there. Um, I would say the performative aspect, if people are trying to um, look good, show kind of show a side that, you know, try to portray something they're not. We talked about Paul's letters being authentic and real. And of course, that's what we want to promote on social media. Um, last point, same thing, appearances and envy. You know, I, I have a niece who kind of jokingly posted, here's my Instagram family and it's this beautiful portrait. And then here's the real thing and there's cereal on the floor and toys <laughs> everywhere. And, um, we don't want to be like that with our church profiles, right? We've got to show the cereal on the floor. So here's how to find, figure out if a profile is real. First of all, ask people offline, not right there, is do you know this person? If nobody knows the person, what are they doing on your church site, right? Um, you can right click the photo and search on Google and that will let you see if it's a stock image or which is less likely yeah. to be a person. Gotcha. Um, you can check the profile about to see if you notice they have pictures taken. We had one who was really causing some um, problems on the Church of the Brethren and we looked and it was like, that person's from Ukraine. We don't have a Church of the Brethren in Ukraine. So we blocked them. Um, and it's okay to block somebody even if in doubt. It's mm. They don't even necessarily know. And if you're sure it's a fake prowl, report it. Please don't report it if it's not. We lost the um, material resources Facebook because the person's aunt reported it. <laughs> she didn't think it was real when it was, so it was hard to get back. But um, if you know it's for sure not a real profile, you can report it. So, and here's just some random information I thought was interesting. 70% of YouTube viewers watch videos for help with a problem. Just mm. interesting to think about. A lot of people watch video with the sound off. Something to think about when you're posting video. <laughs> Um, Facebook and Twitter with images, you get a lot more response. So think about your images. And um, YouTube reaches more 18 year olds, 18 plus year olds during prime time than any cable TV network. So, and the interesting thing is you too can also be on YouTube, whereas you can't really be on cable TV. So <laughs> you can be where everybody is. So let me stop sharing. You all are so, um, interesting and having such good conversations that I think we're getting awfully close to the end of our um, time. Um, do you have questions or concerns this is raised or loose ends we've left? One note I will share just briefly, if you are interested in doing a little more on social media, but you wish there was a more efficient way to do it, there are things that schedule social media. There's tools which include things like Hootsuite. You can look up schedule social media um, and look up the services you want to use. And that lets you say post to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, when you have time and then post it. We don't tend to use that for the Church of the Brethren because we like the flexibility of just doing it um, in real time. The BVS office does use those, that kind of tool and so does the youth and young adult. The what, one thing I'll say. The one you mentioned was? Um, that's a popular Hootsuite. But I can say search because if, let's say you say, I want to schedule Facebook and Pinterest, they have different prices, they have different services they do. So to, you know, give a search to see what would help you. It's one way to do it. I would say if you've scheduled social media, and something big happens in the world, go back and look at your post. Because if you were like, yay, ice cream, and there was just a major earthquake, it's gonna really jar. 
So um, just be aware when scheduling, the world can change really fast. <laughs> so <laughs> um, make sure you look at that. But there's a bunch of different tools and it would just be to find one that works for you. And most of them have a free trial. So you can test it out and see if you like it or not. Any leftover questions? It's a lot to digest because I'm not savvy with all these things you're talking about, but okay. see if I, I can find somebody who is, it can help me. <laughs> I didn't think I could ever Zoom either, but like here I am. So there, there is you possibility. Are. Right. <laughs> you know, I would say that's one of the biggest things is not to be afraid. Just, you know, just try it and see. Yeah. And um, don't be afraid. And Google is your friend. You can always, anything, if you put like Facebook, how do I, you honestly can usually find the answer. Okay. So, um, okay, Stan now is going to hear my secret from work, but all the time people are like, how can I do this? And I'm like, Dil -dil -dil -dil. here, here's the link. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it really is not too bad. And the only, the main mistake you could make would be to not be loving. And I'm sure you would be loving so that, mm -hmm. you know, Social media with great love is going to be okay, even if your finger is in front of the camera. <laughs> well, unless if you have to block somebody, yeah. but you can still do it out of love, right? Yeah. You can block them out of love. They should be spending their time better. <laughs> their life should be more productive if they weren't doing this. <laughs> um, Stan, I think we're almost at the time. Did you want to talk about the CEU? Yes. Thank you, Jan, and, and thank you for a wonderful presentation and inviting everyone into the conversation tonight on social media. I've uh, pasted the uh, link to the CEU uh, page, and so you can uh, click on that or copy and paste and uh, fill out the information. And as you, uh, everyone here is a veteran, so I'll just say, as you are aware, you will receive uh, the PDF uh, certificate from uh, Brethren Academy in a few days as they process them and uh, that will be sent to you by email. So, Jan, thank you so much for a, a wonderful uh, presentation tonight and an inviting and engaging way that you've uh, invited us into this conversation and thank you Kevin, Mark, and Linda for being with us tonight. And for those of you who may be picking up on this webinar at a later time through the recording, and we hope that it has been a uh, helpful uh, presentation with, uh, with the great content that was shared that can help you in your work, uh, both personally, but also for your congregation as well. Thanks, Thank and a again. quick note, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if I can, if you just click the contact us button on the um, brethren.org website, I'm usually the person who's answering that. So um, otherwise I just posted this here and you can also find contact information on the website. So please don't hesitate if you just wanna um, run something by or ask a question, I'm happy to um, answer that. So thank you very much. Cause you are the few, the thank brave, you. the Tuesday <laughs> night winners. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> and thank you, Jan, and thank you, Stan, for, for doing these for us. It, it has been uh, nice to be able to get some from perspectives that we're uh, familiar with, and uh, that, that's helpful. Great. Right. Thanks for being here. Very much so, yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Good. Take right, care. Everyone. Night. For your Night. Night. Bye bye. Have a Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good evening. Me thank too. You. Well, did we forget anybody this time? Uh, no, I don't.